there, there's that picture we were talking about. Does that capture kind of what's going on, Graham, there in uh, your head? No, but, no. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, I, th I, I think um, I needed a promotional uh, eight by 10 uh, at the time. That was the big thing. Have these pictures and you take them around and just throw them at people. Um, yeah. And uh, so I needed one. And so my dad took this picture on a uh, rice slip uh, tube station. I, I think I was like 18 or something like that. Anyway, close. And uh, so, yeah, I just had my hair permed and uh, bought some snazz <laughs> snazzy clothes and uh, went out and had this picture taken. And honestly, this is how I felt normally at the end of the night. Um, uh, no way to get home and uh, have all of your gear just sitting on the train station wait, waiting for the train to show up. So, it was, it was so cool did picture. you jump the turnstile to get into the tube station? Uh, actually, we had to talk to the station master and make sure that we could get in and go and do all of the stuff there. It's uh, um, just a courtesy. There's no turnstile there. They trust everybody. That's kind of cool. oh, oh, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Unlike what happens in New York. <laughs> Yeah. Graham, how come how come you moved to the states graham what started that initiated uh, that uh that's a great question uh i just um uh so it's a really long story um honestly it really is uh but i i met somebody on a boat and then uh you know honestly it's kind of um unre so she said you know if you want to be together we probably have to be together um and so that's kind of what started that um i i felt that that was a little unreasonable, but, uh, you know, you know, if you're going to be married, you probably need to be in the same house, I suppose. Uh, so that's, uh, kind of how that went, but yeah, it was, it was cool, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't move for another eight years after this picture. I don't think. Wow. That's a long distance relationship for sure. Well, I didn't know her then either. So. Was that well, Deb? That wasn't Deb? That was uh -huh. that Deb? Yeah. Yay. Uh, okay, Melanie, mute yourself. <laughs> And Graham, uh, it's it's on you, my friend. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, this has um, been uh, quite the challenge getting this together. Um, as you can imagine, in my real job, uh, we're really busy, um, and that's a really cool thing. Um, but it just has been uh, sucking up my time, and then of course uh, trying to do all of that remotely too has just uh, just been difficult. So. Um, we, we got a whole bunch of songs here. So uh, I think um, Bob sent me this email uh, last week and she said, hey, uh, you know, how about the 20th? Uh, will you do that? And I was like, yeah, no problem. And then the more I thought about it, what was I going to do? So anyway, um, I started to think about all of the different songs that are out there. And there's a, a list of songs. I don't know if you all have it, um, but uh, I, I chose uh, a few. There's about eight of them. And... The first one is uh, Mary, Did You Know? And I, you know, this gets sung a lot, I think, and, and has been copied by a lot of people. Um, it's one of the few Christmas classics that's actually been written in the last few decades. Uh, Mark Lowry and Buddy Green wrote the, the song in like 1984. Um, and uh, I don't know if you know Mark Lowry, but actually he's a, he's a comedian, uh, kind of a humorist, really, you know, real funny guy. Um, so it's kind of weird in a way that he wrote this song. Um, and uh, he, he didn't just write uh, Mary Did You Know, but he's kind of mostly known for singing lead in the Gaither vocal band. I don't know if you know them. Um, and doing stand-up and writing columns and things like that. So, um, so whilst writing for the band, uh, he actually meditated um, and went to um, a sermon, uh, 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 um, kind of like a retreat, if you like, um, and meditated on the, the Christmas story found in the Gospels of uh, Matthew and Luke, and especially pondered on Mary. And uh, so out of that, um, of course, uh, as you know from Luke, uh, there's the angel that comes and talks to Mary, of course. And uh, the Mary says, uh, the Mary, the angel says, Don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. Uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And the angel went on to say, the, the Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So there's really five things about this song. The first one is really is that Mary knew that she had found favor with God. Catholics and Protestants, regardless of their differences about Mary, all agree that she was special, chosen, and blessed. They do agree on that. 
Mary knew that she would bear a son who would be named Jesus, meaning Savior, and she would give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. She knew that. Mary knew Jesus was the Son of God and the Son of the Most High. That's the third thing. The fourth thing was that Mary knew that Jesus was from the kingly line of his ancestor David and that God would give him David's throne and an eternal kingdom that would never end. So she knew that too. And the fifth, probably the most important thing, is that Mary knew more than anybody that her pregnancy was a result of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High. She knew that. So did she know? Yes, yes, she knew. Um, I think it's uh, pretty obvious that she knew, of course, but that doesn't and shouldn't probably ruin the fact that this is a beautiful Christmas song. And the questions are rhetorical, of course, and uh, could easily just be answered with a yes. That's what my kids would do. Yes, she knows. Um, but even when we know the biblical answers, I think we still ponder the questions, and it's always good to kind of uh, exercise and, and keep doing that. So uh, our first song today is uh, Mary, Do You Know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know? your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new this child that you've delivered will soon deliver you Mary did you know that your baby boy would give sight to blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know Wow, there you go. that that didn't even sound. It sounded like it was a recording. It was that good. Wow, thanks. So, yeah. um, so my next song was uh, "Bellow Wood." I I've done this before. In fact, uh, those of you that know Marsha Dale, uh, this is a favorite song that I've ever done. And uh, every Christmas, she'd be like, "Are you going to do Bellow Wood?" 
And, uh, you know, I'd have to disappoint her from doing it year after year after year. But this really is a great song. It's uh, written by Garth Brooks um, and uh, Joe Henry. Uh, he's also penned a lot of songs with Garth and other country stars over the years. Uh, look, it's a, st it's a story about soldiers in World War I, and it's a beautiful idea. But the question is, uh, did it really happen? Um, look, look, mostly, right? It mostly happened. Uh, Bellow Wood, um, written in um, uh, 1987, um, is a story about a Christmas truce that happened in Bellowood in 1914 on Christmas Day. And um, the, what happens is the German and the British soldiers are ab about 50 foot away from each other in trenches um, in Bellowood. And uh, then suddenly uh, the, a German soldier stands up and starts singing Silent Night. And one by one, each of the 100,000 soldiers gets out and joins in. And so um, it's true that Bella Wood, which is in France, by the way, um, it was the site of several significant battles. Um, I, I mean, a lot of battles. But German forces never marched into uh, Bella Wood um, until June of 1918. Uh, so, so they never fought the British in Bella Wood at all. And, and honestly, even if they had, um, they wouldn't have sung cowls because it was June. So uh, I'm pretty certain that didn't happen. So um, that part is not true. However, um, there was an event on Christmas Day in 1914, and that is true. About 100,000 soldiers participated in a truce, and soldiers crossed trenches to go and talk and exchange food and souvenirs, even pictures um, from home, and often sang cowls together. And, and it, it's kind of remarkable to me that soldiers got out of their trenches, put down their weapons, and even organized a game of football um, uh, in that 24 hours. And at the stroke of midnight the following day, going into uh, Boxing Day, as we would call it in the UK, um, there, uh, the fighting started up again. And so that's where the story ends. And Garth Brooks got it half right, I guess. Um, either way, look, it's an incredible story of uh, people coming together and uh, finding common ground and taking a moment to feel good about right now, this moment. And uh, so I, I think this deserves to be on the list for sure. Um, and so uh, enjoy this, uh, it's Bella Wood. Oh, the snowflakes fell in silence over Bella Wood that night. For a Christmas truce had been declared by both sides of the fight. And as we lay there in our trenches, the silence broke into by a German soldier singing a song that we all knew. Though I did not know the language, the song was silent night. Then I heard my buddy whisper, all is calm and all is bright. Then the fear and doubt surrounded me, cause I'd die if I was wrong. But I stood up in my train. And I began to sing along Then across the frozen battlefield Another's voice joined in Until one by one each man became A singer of the hymn Then I thought that I was dreaming Cause right there in my sight Stood the German soldier Neath the falling flakes of white And he raised his hand and smiled at me As if he seemed to say He's hoping Find a better way Then the devil's clock struck midnight And the skies lit up again And the 
Just one fleeting moment The answer seems so clear Heaven's not beyond the clouds It's just beyond the fear Heaven's not beyond the clouds It's for us to find So, uh, that's a fun song. I love doing that song. So, hey, Graham, um, yeah. Uh, if, if anybody's seen the movie War Horse, that whole uh, incident and in the, the, the singing of the song and the, uh, soldiers coming together out in the, uh, between the trenches playing football uh, is all enacted there. It's yeah. amazing to see. Yeah, it really is. The cool. movie War Horse it's and play. It's a great movie too. Um, so, um, the next song is uh, "We Three Kings." Uh, why did I pick this? Um, well, there's some significance to this song. Um, it's a, it's an actual carol. Uh, it's not a song. We'll talk about that um, in a little bit. But uh, this was written by uh, John Henry Hopkins Jr. Actually, his father was also a songwriter, and um, he wrote this uh, when he was a rector of Christ uh, Episcopal Church in Williamsport. Pennsylvania and wrote it in 1857. Um, look, there's been a lot of different versions of this. Uh, like we Three Kings, I think uh, the Three Kings of Orient, uh, We Three Kings of Orient are uh, the Quest of the Magi. I think there's all sorts of other, uh, other titles for this song. Uh, same song, though. It was actually written um, for a Christmas pageant uh, for New York City. Um, and uh, look, this this carol is organized in such a way that there's three male voices. There's five verses altogether. If you go to the theater, you'll know that there's a prelude, um, and uh, that's really kind of the, the first goalpost of uh, how the musical starts. And this song has a, a similar kind of uh, structure as any of those songs. So as is this prelude, which is uh, everybody kind of setting up the scene, if you like. That's the first verse. Then there's three verses right in the middle, the intermediate verses. And there's three because there's three kings, and they, they all talk about um, what they're bringing. And I think somebody's unmuted, probably, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, uh, so there are three uh, verses. They all talk about the gifts that they bring. And then the last one uh, is really everybody coming together. Um, and then doing that um, finale, if you like. Um, in a lot of ways uh, in music, um, we, will, we will call those refrains, um, even though we know sometimes a refrain as being a chorus. Uh, this is actually a refrain. So the prelude, the intermediate, and then the refrain at the end, that's everybody coming together. So that's how it's structured. It's really kind of cool. Um, look, we don't normally set it up like that. Everybody sings all the, vo the, the voices in all of the verses, so you don't really kind of get the story. But if you think about it as you sing along here in a second, how it, how it works. It also is um, one of these uh, kind of uh, uh, songs that has a lilt to it. It's, it's written in a three time. So it's... Uh so it has the same kind of... Uh, imagine getting a square can and trying to roll it down a steep hill. It's got this kind of, it doesn't really roll very well, um, but it has this kind of tilt that says, oh, okay, I'm going forward um, in some kind of fashion. And so because of that lilt that's in there, um, it feels a little sad and a little, I don't know, shifting maybe in nature. So it sounds almost uh, Eastern Europe or from the Middle Ages, right? It's got that kind of tempo to it. And so um, a lot of people think that this was written by um, a Haydn or a Mozart or somebody like that. Um, but uh, John Henry Hopkins is the, the, the guy that wrote it. Um, noteworthy, just so you know, this is one of two Christmas carols that exists. It's been written by one person. 
So uh, all the others are written by a lyricist and uh, uh, some kind of musician that has written the melody, at least maybe not even the arrangement, but at least the melody. We're going to do both those songs that have been written by one person um, today, and this is the first one. Uh, it's also the first Christmas carol that ever originated out of the US um, that got published and then got recognized by uh, the Oxford Book of Carols in 1878, uh, claiming the top spot for, for many years. So, uh, so we're going to sing the first one, uh, We Three Kings. Here we go. Field and fountain Three Kings, moving on. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, so I looked around for songs that were a little different, maybe came from different parts of the world. And uh, the one from Hawaii, uh, which is actually not from Hawaii, uh, came up. So you probably know it as uh, Mele Kalikimaka. And um, we'll talk about how we get to that word in a second. Um, but Mele are really chants and songs or poems uh, in Hawaii. The term comes from the Hawaiian language. Um, it's frequently used in any kind of song title um, so, and such, anything like that. And also in books, book titles, you'll see the word melee a lot. 
Um, it's pronounced Mele Kaliki Maka. Um, it's a Hawaiian themed Christmas song. It was written by Alex Anderson in 1949. And the song takes its title from the Hawaiian phrase of Mele Kaliki Maka, meaning Merry Christmas. Um, Bing Crosby, uh, like one of my favorites of all time, I love Bing Crosby. I actually do two of his releases today. Um, uh, sung this song in 1950, came up massive hit for Bing. Um, and actually got him to be able to put all of his uh, Merry Christmas album in 1955 together. It was on there. But the guy that wrote it, um, and, and you've probably seen this song in, in a lot of different places. If you've seen National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Catch Me If You Can, LA Confidential, any of those, this song is in there. Um, and the guy uh, who wrote it, Alex Anderson, uh, was actually a stenographer um, in Hollywood and knew Bing Crosby. And one of the girls in his office said, hey, you know, I don't really understand. She goes, why the Hawaiians don't have any of their own Christmas songs? You know, they take all of the hymns and they put Hawaiian words to the hymns and things like that, but they don't have their own uh, original melody. So he decided to pen down a, a new song, and this is it. Um, he shared it with Bing Crosby, who loved it so much, he actually the next week went to the recording studio and brought it back to Anderson and said, here you go. It was just meant to, uh, to be a personal gift, um, but then everybody got to hear about it, and then they released it, and uh, so the story goes. But the, the problem with this was how did we get to um, Mele Kaliki Maka? Well, the Hawaiian language, I don't know if you know this, has uh, lots of constraints to it. Uh, you can't use the, word, uh, the letter S, you can't use the letter R, um, and it's got this kind of phonotactic constraints that don't really permit consonants to be um, uh, next to each other and at the end of syllables or you can't have consonant clusters and all of this other stuff. So anyway, that's the closest that we can get to Merry Christmas is Mele Kiliki Maka. So here's how it works. So we have uh, Christmas, right? We know it's going to have Mele in it because it's a song, right? And, and it also means Merry, so fine. So th the word Christmas is troubling. Uh, it's got CH at the beginning of it. I mean, it's also got a T in the middle of there next to an S. And I just said we can't have letters S and we can't put two consonants together. So we've got to change one. So we replace the H with a vowel, in this case A, and we remove the T. So now we've got carissimas with a C. But we can't use uh, a, a consonant. Um, we have to we have to add something on there, right? Because otherwise we can't put a, um, a consonant at the end of the word. So we have to end with a vowel. So we put an A on there. So now we've got carissimasa. So R is not a letter. So now I've got to take the R out. Uh, so we replaced it with an L. So now we've got carissimasa. And then S is not a letter. Remember we said that? No R's, no S's. And so that's how we replace the S then. And we've got kala kalikimaka. All right. So complicated, right? Complicated stuff. Uh, but anyway, um, I worked a lot on this song. Um, Bing Crosby releases with the Andrews sisters um, in 1950. And so uh, I know Liz can't do all of the Andrews sisters, so I stole them and put them on here. So it's not just rappers that can steal tunes and vocals from songs. Uh, I can do it here at home. And uh, you can too, probably. So here we go, uh, Mele Kaliki Maka. This is a kind of a fun thing. Um, here we go. Oh, somebody, I think somebody's got their mic on and we're feeding back somewhere. Neil. Neil, Neil. Okay, here we go. thing to say on a bright Hawaiian Christmas day. That's the island greeting that we send to you from the land where palm trees sway. Here we know that Christmas will be green and bright, that the sun will shine by day and all the stars at night. Okay, key change, Andrew Sisters. Mele Kalikimaka is the thing to say On a bright Hawaiian Christmas day That's the island greeting that we send to you From the land where palm trees sway Here we know that Christmas will be green and bright The sun to shine by day and all the stars 
Sisters, know, and you I played really along. Shh. Great. Don't say anything about it. Just, uh, let's just <laughs> I move will. on. I didn't pay them any royalties. I think they're well, all dead. We will. It's fine. Okay, good, good, good news. Uh, next one, uh, we're going to bring uh, Alyssa on, who's uh, been sitting here patiently in the back. We're going to do Silent Night. Um, uh, obviously, penned originally as Stillnacht, Hilachnacht. It's a popular Christmas carol. 1818, uh, Franz Gruber was um, uh, wrote the music. And the lyrics were written by Joseph Moore, um, and uh, they lived in uh, Salzburg, I think, Austria. Uh, Austria. Um, and actually, uh, it's such a big thing for Austria that in 2011, they actually declared it as an intangible cultural heritage um, and uh, put, put a patent on it. Um, uh, on Christmas Eve of 1818, Moore brought the words to Gruber and asked him to compose a melody, I'm not kidding, um, uh, with a gu guitar accompaniment for that night's mass that night. So what had happened was um, they were, uh, the church um, was uh, flooded and had got into the organ there. And so now they didn't have the organ, um, which uh, Moore would uh, play. So anyway, that river flooding had uh, damaged the church organ and couldn't do it, so they needed an accompaniment. And so they, uh, the, he needed a, a new tune and everything, so go get Gruber to do it. So the church was eventually destroyed, by the way, just so you know, from repeated uh, flooding, and they replaced it with what you might know now today as the Silent Night Chapel, um, and it's out there if you ever go out there. Um, it's unknown, really, kind of what inspired him to write the lyrics or what prompted him to create a new cowl, uh, exactly, um, but it's been done by a lot of people. Another one of my favorites, of course, right, is Bing Crosby, and Bing Crosby did this in 1935, and is still today the fourth best-selling single of all time. Uh, so people love this uh, song. Um, uh, the original manuscript had been lost, by the way, uh, presumably in uh, one of the floods, we're not really sure, and his name, Moore's name, had been forgotten. Um, and a lot of people thought, again, like uh, uh, some other songs, that either Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, or somebody else had written this. Um, that's what was thought for a long time. And in fact, in many kind of Christmas, Christmas books, um, it was unknown. Uh, they didn't really know who had written it. Um, until 1995, when the original manuscript uh, showed back up, um, and uh, it was dated by researchers to be uh, 1820. So really cool um, that, that we have that back. And uh, anyway, here we are 202 years later, uh, singing it again. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, Silent Night. It's German, but it's still cool, right? I'm just kidding. All right, Silent Night. Here we go. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. 
silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. It's a great song still, right? Thanks, Liz. She's awesome. She can't actually hear you, but she, she can hear me, so that's cool. All right. So uh, I like Christmas as much as the next person, as you can tell from my outfit, right? I put this on special for you. Um, uh, but there's one new holiday tradition that I really haven't quite fig figured out, and that's why people treat the song Hallelujah like a Christmas song. I, I, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So... I dug in to try and find out what went on. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Leonard Cohen, who actually penned this song, right, is a fantastic songwriter, and the tune definitely is an absolute classic. That I get. All right, but the song is a lot of things, but a holiday tune, it is not. Uh, like many of Cohen's songs, there's religious kind of imagery, if you like, at its core, but this kind of iconic song thing is about love gone wrong, uh, broken hearts. I mean, it just... Uh, anyway, with lyrics like... Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and broken hallelujah. Uh, the lyrics are cold and biting, not exactly that fits uh, kind of the holiday celebration of the birth of Christ, I don't think. So how exactly did hallelujah make it onto the holiday playlists? Uh, and it's on the radio stations all the time, right? Um, well, uh, I've searched, and there doesn't seem to be a clear origin, um, at least of, the, of how it became a holiday hit, but I do have a work in theory, so stick with me. Uh, it's in two parts. First off, people don't listen to lyrics. 
That's the first thing, right? So I think what happens is people kind of dig the sound and the melody of you know, songs and things like that, but they don't actually intently listen to lyrics. So what happens here is um, they hear a great song and people are shouting out hallelujah, so they think it's a holiday song. That's the first thing. So the second thing is, is that while hallelujah has a really great melody, which it does, and that's why we're going to do it here, um, other groups who have covered the song have changed the, the original lyrics. And so Cloverdon, the band, um, had uh, a strictly Christmas version of the tune, took out all of those dark words. And Pentatonix, uh, the a cappella group, also have taken out some of the darker, more depressing lyrics um, to kind of, uh, well, sanitize right uh, the, the song a little bit. So if you put those two things together, I think you kind of get a recipe where one of the greatest songs about heartbreak and loss uh, suddenly becomes a Christmas classic. So uh, uh, for that reason, it kind of made, uh, made my list, and uh, I think it's a great song anyway. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do that. Okay, hallelujah. I heard there was a secret con that David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift The baffled king composing Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. The beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to the kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. And
still a great song. This is a great song. Uh, Paige, I think your iPhone, uh, I think your iPhone might be on. I maybe it's not off mute. Uh, all right. Um, so this next one. Uh, so this next song. You remember I said earlier that there was going to be two songs that were penned just by one person, um, and this is the second one. So. Um, this is actually the newest of all of the songs today. It was written in 2017, orchestrated in 2018, recorded in Great Britain and the USA. And it's a carol. Uh, yeah, it's a carol by definition, right? Written by one person, but scored, produced, mixed, mastered, and performed by members of the same family, which is kind of cool. So a carol is a festive song, generally religious, but not necessarily connected to church worship and often with a repetitive catch in the verse or chorus. That's what defines a carol. Uh, the verb carolin or to carol um, also refers to the singing of carols, and the earliest version really is about uh, wassailing, right? Um, and uh, it really involved people going door to door and giving out well wishes during the colder months. That's where it all started. So it's a first. You're going to hear it here first. Well, not exactly first, to be honest with you. Um, kind of maybe third or fourth. Uh, the song's been played by, by the BBC Radio um, uh, before. It's also been uh, played on the radio in St. Helena, the Ascension Islands, Falkland Islands, um, and it's going to be done here today. So not only do you have me and Alyssa to hear to perform it, but actually we have the writer with us uh, online today, uh, which is my mom. So she's online. So, uh, mom, you got a you got anything to say um, about the song itself? Well, I never expected the song to be created by my family to make the what I wrote into a really fantastic sound, which I think it is. And I just wrote a little Christmas song. And then Graham said to me, well, why don't you let me do something with it? So I said, well, like what? So he said, well, I'd like to sing it for a start, which is amazing because I think Graham still has an amazing voice because he was head chorister at Manchester Cathedral in um, Manchester where he went to school. So he was going to sing it. And then we created between us transatlantically by mp3s and facetime um the the track and it was really really difficult because he would send me like two or three notes and say well what do you think of this and i say hmm okay maybe oh so you don't like it so he'd do it again and then he'd send it back and and this, of course, is with a time lapse as well, because your time, I mean, it's dark here and you're in the morning. So when he was, oh, sorry, my cat just got up there. So when, when, <laughs> so when, no, you're jealous, aren't you? So when um, Graham was asleep, I was reading his message to me to say, do you like this? And then it sort of gradually got better and better. And then I said to him, could I please have some more bells? Could I please have some more brass? And he thought, oh. And we got there in the end. We did. And then I threw a spanner ring at work. And I don't know if you say that in America, but we said so by saying throw a spanner ring at work means I really put something in there that, hmm, not sure about that. And I wanted a children's choir. I love children's choirs and I wanted a children's choir to sing the chorus. Well, where am I going to get a children's choir, he said. I said, I don't, I don't know. Then he said, I know. I'll use my, my girls. So Elisa and Henna were recorded and they recorded over and over and over again until they sounded like a children's choir. The song was put on YouTube and the BBC contacted me and invited me to the studio for an interview, a live interview, and I was shaking because it was live. But what they also did, 
they connected with Graham and Elissa and Henna, and we were all on the BBC radio talking about my song. And then they played the song, and then they played it the next night and the next night and the next night and the next night. And so I'm, I'm really glad to have been invited here today and to let you know how my song has become a family song. Um, I can't wait to hear Graham sing it. All right. So there you go. There's, uh, there's the composer, the lyricist, uh, uh, and, the, um, and the writer of the melody and the accompaniment and all the orchestration and all of that kind of good stuff. So uh, very, very super cool. So look, um, mom didn't write this as a religious statement, but more really of a go ahead, have some fun and merriment, right? Um, but let's not forget the real meaning of the day. So it was fun to do. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll do another. Um, we'll see. Uh, so you can get this on um, Apple and Amazon and Spotify or your favorite place to stream songs soon. Uh, well, not songs, carols, right? It's a carol. Uh, so here we go. Um, uh, everybody on mute? I hope so. Uh, here we go. Uh, don't forget Jesus. It's really, it's Christmas. Don't forget Jesus. Here we go. It's Christmas, it's Christmas, wonderful time of the year, with fairy lights so pretty and bright, and children all wondering if Santa is near. But don't forget Jesus asleep on the hay, Son of God in a manger he lay, dear little baby we'd just like to say, thank you for Christmas Day. It's Christmas, it's Christmas, hang up your stocking Don't forget Jesus asleep on the hay, Son of God in a manger he lay. Dear little baby, we'd just like to say thank you for Christmas Day.
Very cool. All right, so that wraps me up for the day. Um, we'll do a uh, God rest you, jo uh, Jerry Mentalman. I was going to say, you know, as a kid, we we always called it that. I don't know why, but we will do God rest you, merry gentlemen. Uh, which, by the way, just so you know, there was never a ye in there. It's God bless you, merry gentlemen. Uh, Charles Dickens is in there. Um, it's a really cool story. Um, but uh, we'll do that on the way out. I know we're over time. And uh, so that's it for me today. This was fun. Um, and I know it we was fun. fun. Thank you. Yeah, Fabulous. you're welcome. I, I know we probably have a, a, a nice little uh, prayer on the way out. And uh, what else are we going to do? Uh, we're just going to hang out for a while after we're done. Uh, I'd like to, to thank all of you who came uh, in from across the pond. And uh, it's, yeah, yeah. And it's um, getting to be bedtime for you, I guess. Or we're close. Yeah. Or have a nightcap. <laughs> so uh, you're welcome to stay. Yeah.